We've been looking at this man, Nathaniel Hawthorne, one of the great writers of the tale during the period we call the American Renaissance. Associated with Salem, his birthplace, where he spent more than 40 years, and also Concord in Massachusetts, where he lived for three years with his new bride, Sophia, in this building, this house, the old manse, cultivating friends with Ralph, friendships with Ralph Waldo Emerson, Ellery Channing, Bronson Alcott, George Ripley, the founder of Brook Farm, and Henry David Thoreau. And of course, there were years of personal happiness during this period with Sophia, and also great productivity, with one book already done in 1837, that is, twice told tales, uh, Hawthorne produced another 20 or so long tales during this period, which made up the collection known as Mosses from an Old Manse. Welcome to English 3350, a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're in Studio 3 at the MD Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood, and today we're continuing with the second of three classes in which we look at Nathaniel Hawthorne, author of numerous tales and four um, romances. Today we're going to be starting to look at um, some of his tales that draw on the Puritan um, background from the 17th century in New England. Here are those volumes that we've shown you before with the, these, the tales that we're looking at in the course um, listed here. We've looked in detail at the, uh, the birthmark and at Rappaccini's daughter, which are both from the 1846 Mosses from an Old Manse. And these two stories uh, are of a kind, stories of overreaching scientists. Uh, both involve males who are seen almost in Faustian terms. That is, they've traded their humanity for power, as Dr. Faustus did when he made a pact with the devil. If you know your British literature, you'll know the Renaissance play, Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. And of course, there's also the German Goethe, uh, his work, uh, Faust. And uh, as Faust uh, made a pact with the devil in those particular works, and that's a long uh, tradition uh, in literature. In Hawthorne, we don't have any direct pact with the devil, but we nevertheless have a kind of development within the Faustian tradition, a turning over of the soul in exchange for unlimited power. And I suppose Hawthorne's Faustian scientists uh, um, undergo a, an enormous loss in their humanity in both Rappaccini's daughter and, and, um, and certainly in uh, the birthmark. And both losses, of course, in these two stories are ironic because they in, the stories both involve a search for perfection. In this sense, both stories run parallel to Poe's, Edgar Allan Poe's Lygea which is also an attempt to preserve a beautiful and perfect woman. And of course, as, we'll, as we've also seen in, in the fall of the House of Usher, we have Roderick Usher who tries to preserve his sister Madeline in a state of suspended animation. So these, in, in one sense, these tales are uh, both part of a kind of extended part of the uh, Faustian tradition. Now, the stories that we're going to look at today um, are stories uh, with a different twist to them, and these draw on the Puritan um, background. We've had a look at the Maypole of, of Marymount, and today we're going to look at, um, again, to, to look at these on the screen, we're going to look at uh, the Minister's Black Veil, which, uh, appeared in the Twice Told Tales, one of his early 
uh, early productions. And then Young Goodman Brown, which is perhaps one of the finest of, of all the tales that Hawthorne wrote. These are set in Puritan New England in the 17th century to recall the situation. This is the time of, of uh, Winthrop and Bradford, uh, the poets Anne Bradstreet and Edward Taylor, and of course Cotton Mather, the great Puritan historian who was not only author of the Magnalia Christi Americana, but also the, the historian who wrote up the Salem witch trials in his work, The Wonders of the Invisible World. Here's a place that Hawthorne knew because he was born in Salem. This is Gallows Hill outside Salem. This is where the executions of the witches took place. A tourist mark today, but an infamous one one that the people of Salem are not terribly pleased with. We always we need to remember that Hawthorne was from Salem and that he had this background uh, uh, of these witch trials from 1692 to 1693. And um, even though the witchcraft uh, business only enters some of Hawthorne's work, the, the spirit of the, the age, the, this period of the late 17th century, is always very apparent in his work. The overpowering sense of guilt and sin is something that we are going to find again and again in um, Hawthorne's tales and in his romances. And the trauma of the individual caught in a web and that's partly, I suppose, in theological terms, a web of, of providence, but it's a web, too, of, of a kind of um, satanic power. The minister's black veil, a very interesting story. Mr. Hooper is uh, a respected minister of Milford, a village in Puritan New England. One day he appears for the morning Sunday service with a black veil and delivers his, uh, his Sunday sermon. His topic is an interesting one, secret sin. The sermon that he preaches, the sermon had reference to secret sin and those sad mysteries which we hide from our nearest and dearest and would fain conceal from our own consciousness, even forgetting that the omniscient can detect them. A subtle power was breathed into his words. Each member of the congregation felt as if the preacher had crept upon them behind his awful veil and discovered their hoarded iniquity. So the sermon suggests that everyone in the congregation is a secret sinner because Hooper himself is veiled when he preaches the sermon and of course the message has much more impact no one can hide from omniscience the mystery of the veil of course is is what puzzles the reader and it puzzles the citizens of of Milford too, there appears to be no precipitating event, no obvious motivation, no sin hinted at that would explain why Hooper has decided to wear a veil. And this mystery almost by itself shakes up his parishioners. Elizabeth is referred to in the story as his plighted wife or pledged wife, his fiancée. At first, she appears to be patient and understanding. She doesn't get upset. Um, um, she's even a little amused, perhaps, by his veil. And she lightheartedly tries to draw him out, to have him explain this, to take off the veil and explain it. And his answer makes it very clear that he's not going to remove the veil. He says that uh, he's going to leave it on for the rest of his life. 
and their conversation leaves his motivations for wearing the veil quite hidden, and we don't really learn much more in the story. Uh, Hooper remains enigmatic, and when his uh, plighted um, wife says, well, I guess that's it, farewell, and, and in, in effect breaks off the relationship, there's a kind of wistful smile on his face. Uh, no words that would suggest any kind of uh, unhappiness or grief. He's, he just accepts this as a consequence of his decision to wear this veil. He, um, he of course, tries, to, he does, before she says farewell, he, he asks his wife to bear with him to forego ever seeing his, his face. And he does explain to her that, that everyone has their own veil of shame and, and sin for unknown sins committed. And even if uh, most people make no attempt to hide them, they're still there. It's, but Elizabeth is simply unsuccessful in her uh, uh, sort of jocular approach to him. The veil will remain in place until he dies. And as I say, he, um, she bids him farewell, and, and in effect, the veil then stops their marriage. The uh, parishioners remain apprehensive uh, through this story, even frightened by this veiled minister who appears before them week after week. But by and large, I think they're more tolerant, certainly more tolerant than, uh, than Elizabeth was. Uh, the veil apparently reminds people of their own lives, much in the, in the way that Hooper uh, intends that it will remind them of their own secret sins. The problem is that he seems to have lit, led an impeccable life, and this makes their own secret sins even worse. Here is a man who, for no apparent reason, uh, has decided to, to take this, make this radical decision, yet we can't really see what he, he's done to deserve this, and so he seems to be doing this principally to force the message on his parishioners. And uh, his preaching thus is very quiet and, but very effective, and the, the veil successfully adds a good level of meaning to, to his preaching. It provokes thought, and contemplation among those who hear him. His audiences grow. His fame spreads. The mystery of the veil deepens. Um, his influence as a clergyman increases. And this goes on for many years, all the way to his death. And uh, people who remembered his first appearance with the veil, many of them have died. The graveyard fills up. Soon he has more, there are more people that, uh, from his congregation in the graveyard than there are left in the church. And finally he dies on his deathbed, still veiled. A colleague of his, Reverend Clark, is, is at his bedside, suggests removing the veil and actually starts to move his hands to do so, and Father Hooper immediately uh, rushes with his hands to protect the veil and uh, requests that it not be removed. Reverend Clark asks to have the meaning conveyed to him, and uh, why Hooper insists on, on wearing this veil to the end, and um, it, it comes out in a speech that uh, Reverend Hooper delivers on his deathbed when he says, what, but the mystery which it, that is the veil, which it obscurely typifies, has made this piece of crepe so awful. When the th friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, the lover to his best beloved, when man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator, treasuring up the secret of his sin, then deem me a monster, for the symbol beneath, beneath which I have lived and die. I look around, man, and lo, on every visage, a black veil." It's perhaps worth commenting that 
that this story uh, is part of a Puritan context, part of a Protestant context, and uh, it's worth reminding ourselves that Protestantism really doesn't have the institution which is such a common part of the, of the Catholic branch of Christianity, the, uh, the institution of the confession. And um, that particular uh, institution is, it marks a very uh, different uh, approach uh, to sin and guilt. The, uh, the Catholic approach with the possibility of confession uh, in, in a sense draws people out to confess their sins, whereas the Protestant tradition in its extreme forms can uh, and has, you know, by research it, it can lead to a kind of bottling up. Uh, there were some interesting st studies, for instance, done at the uh, beginning of this century by Durkheim on suicide. Very interesting uh, psychological studies which, which uh, showed that uh, suicide was much less prominent in countries that were predominantly Catholic. And Durkheim, uh, Durkheim argued that, that he thought that the Roman Catholic confessional may have had something to do with that because it provides a kind of outlet uh, for the kinds of personal problems that would lead someone to suicide. Um, of course, there's been lots of additional studies since then, but um, but that initial finding is certainly an interesting one that, that does connect, you know, religious belief to certain kinds of psychological behavior. The historical foundation for this story, and remember we, we, we talked about this in connection with the Maypole of Marymount, um, that Hawthorne almost always has some kind of uh, historical background that he is drawing upon. This tale carries a subtitle called a parable and the parable is footnoted. It, it is in the anthology and it is also um, in all texts of this version. It is Hawthorne's own note. Um, a Mr. Joseph Moody who was a minister at York in the, the state of Maine had died Hawthorne says about 80 years ago, and um, by calculation this story was published in 1836, so 80 years ago would, would take us back to uh, about 1756. And Mr. Joseph Mooney, this minister at York, had apparently worn a veil all his life. His reason, apparently uh, he had accidentally killed a friend as a young man, and from that day until his death, he hid his face behind a veil. Now, if we take Hawthorne literally here, the date of, of 1656 is the old man's, this old minister's death, and assuming that he is um, of some advanced age, uh, that would put his early ministry I suppose, into the late 1600s, so you can see it would be squarely within the Puritan period in the, in the 1680s or 1690s. And um, this, this is an interesting uh, piece of lore that, that Hawthorne dug out. Now, there's no reason to question Hawthorne's uh, historical note here although it's worth pointing out that sometimes so-called historical notes in quotation marks are actually fictional historical notes invented by the writer. You can't, you can't always uh, be sure, and uh, we're, we're going to come across a, a good example of that when we look at the, uh, the Scarlet Letter, when we look at Hawthorne's introduction to the Scarlet Letter, the Custom House. Uh, there's, there's a general, generally accepted that a, a good portion of that is fictional, even though it purports to be a kind of historical uh, document. It's probable that some aspects of that are fictional. And of course, there are many, many writers who have indulged in this sort of thing regularly in, in novels, provided something that looks historical, but in fact 
is, is not. Uh, but still, there is no reason here to, uh, to doubt Hawthorne, and especially because the historical example that Hawthorne cites um, had a real reason to it. There was a real reason for uh, Reverend Moody to wear this veil. He had killed someone. And uh, Hawthorne changes the motivation. He, he takes a specific reason on the, um, that, that Moody may have had and makes it into a kind of general principle that, uh, that Reverend Hooper adopts to, to communicate a broader message about the secret sin. Um, and, and thus he's able to develop a tale which is a kind of parable um, to a, a very symbolic sort of story. And um, by now, if you've been looking at these stories, it's fairly apparent that he does write in a highly symbolic fashion that the events, the, the plots, the settings, and certainly the characters almost verge in the direction of being pure symbols. Hawthorne seems obsessed with secret sin. Here, Hooper's secret sin is never, um, is never made clear. In the birthmark, you'll recall, part of the horror of the story is Aylmer's determination to cut out what is referred to as the, the major human frailty, um, an enterprise, of course, that is doomed to, to kill Georgiana. And of course, we'll see much of the uh, Scarlet Letter revolving around the notion of secret sin, too. Hawthorne's obsession with this theme again raises the question, why? Did Hawthorne possess some secret sin he never revealed? If he did, he certainly keeps that well out of view in the minister's black veil. We really can't find any reason to to read this in any kind of biographical fashion. And um, there is one thing here, though, that is rather interesting. Uh, Hooper hides his reasons from his plighted wife. They are due to be married soon. And this stops the marriage. One wonders if there's some kind of secret motive being darkly hinted at here. And it's difficult to get at. Hooper's secret sin, if he has one, is, is sufficiently problematic to, to hide from his plighted wife, which would be the one person that he might uh, tell. And, uh, but it is you know, significantly serious enough for, for him to stop all future relations with her. And, Again, if you read, read Hawthorne carefully, there's a sense in which sexuality is always just under the surface in his stories. There are always hints. And in the case of, um, of Hawthorne uh, applying this to his life, one always wonders. Uh, we're going to come back to this theme again in, an, in the next class when we deal with the Scarlet Letter. It's tempting to, to try to ferret out from the story. If we can't ferret out Hawthorne's uh, nature, it's tempting to try to look at the story for clues about what the secret sin of Hooper might be. There don't seem to be many clues. We, of course, could revert to theology, the Puritan idea that uh, all human beings inherit the sin of Adam, and so the secret sin that he inherits is simply the general uh, sin of, of humanity. But Hawthorne generally is, is not terribly concerned with uh, illustrating Puritan doctrine. Theological ideas in Hawthorne typically form a background to the story. What Hawthorne is more interested in is the foreground, the psychological tangles associated with sin and guilt. Reverend Hooper appears to want to illustrate something for people, maybe the essence of sin, its, its secrecy, the fact that all people are sinful under the veil, they're all sinners, but his method does seem rather extreme. And re it does, I think, reveal that, that he may be a kind of impossible idealist. 
that may be, of course, the crux of the problem for Puritans in general, that they had an excessively ideal notion of what human behavior should be and could be. And this, by creating too high a standard for, for their own believers, this may be one of the reasons why their religion quickly broke down in the 17th century. It also reveals that Cooper, Hooper is projecting sin onto his parishioners. He seems to just assume that everybody is guilty. And uh, wearing this veil in front of people constantly is a kind of uh, in-your-face reminder. All you people should be wearing this veil. I'm the only one that has the courage to do it. Um, and this again is perhaps another Puritan problem, a kind of obsessive um, uh, attention to the whole business of sin. And again, we do know that psychologically that did enormous amount of damage to this population. There was a high level of suicide and mental disease and psychotic problems among the Puritans. That's well documented. So. Uh, we may be getting at some flaws here in Puritanism, and that may be one of Hawthorne's purpose here. Uh, so Reverend Hooper in this analysis would, would be a kind of archetypal Puritan, uh, excessively idealistic about himself, and guilty of projecting evil onto others. This tale then, I suppose, could be described as a kind of anti-Puritan tale. A, a kind of uh, disguised critique of the whole Puritan position. There's something else going on here, though. The re this rejection of his plighted wife is, is a rather interesting phenomenon. Maybe he doesn't need a wife. He is a kind of fastidious, uh, almost womanly sort of, of person. The veil might even suggest this, and one comment by an observer in the story compares his veil to one that a woman might wear on a bonnet. And you know, when you're reading Hawthorne, you really have to read and look carefully at, at everything that he says. Uh, there, there's no detail that's insignificant in a Hawthorne story. So you need to look at a detail like that and say, what's going on there? Does this, really, uh, does this man really need a wife at all? Apparently not, for when his plighted wife says farewell, he just lets her walk and uh, gives one of her, uh, one of his enig enigmatic smiles. One could say one of his silly smiles, I think. It, they come up an, enough in the story that there's a kind of uh, silliness about, uh, about them. Not surprisingly, some observers have suspected that uh, that he has no real secret sin to hide, but simply put on the veil to get out of his marriage. Now, what would that mean? Squeamishness about marriage? Psychological problems concerned with sexuality? We've certainly seen enough of that in the birthmark. Elmer seems particularly distressed by this mark, which, with, which Hawthorne uh, makes very clear is closely connected with the emotions of Georgiana. And the mark comes and goes with her coloring. And when she is most emotional and thus flushed, the birthmark disappears. And uh, I mean, this is very closely, this birthmark in that story is very closely connected with the life force. And, and we've also already seen this in Poe, too, with Lygea, the possibility that, that he's the narrator in that story has uh, some kind of uh, sexual problem. So there are vague suggestions of some kind of sexual problem all through this uh, story. Um, what about that afternoon funeral, for instance, on the first day he wears the veil? A young maiden has died. And Hooper bends over to look at her. And because of the way he bends over, of course, the veil falls away from his face. But he reaches up quickly and pushes the veil to his face. An odd sort of movement, considering that the maiden is dead. Um, 
It's almost as if he wants to separate himself from this young maiden. But bystanders at that very moment think that they see the corpse shudder. Now what is going on here? Did this young minister perhaps have some adventures in the past? The possibility of a sexual liaison here. I mean, it's not out of the question considering what we have in the Scarlet Letter. Something is clearly being suggested and um, Hooper's own secret may be as, as simple as some kind of sexual indulgence. Someone in the funeral procession after this looks back and notices that Hooper is walking, the veiled minister is walking arm in arm with the spirit of the dead maiden. Well, all of these th things that we're referring to here are people's perceptions. Somebody thinks they see the, the corpse shudder. Somebody thinks they see the spirit walking arm in arm with, with Hooper. These are the villagers. Uh, Hawthorne seems to want to explore the responses of people to the veil. Maybe trying to probe the reason for the veil, the secret sin behind the veil, Hooper's motivations, maybe that's only part of the story. Maybe that's a misguided search. Maybe the real thing is we should be looking at is how people interpret it. What this story is is a series of little innuendos and interpretations of the veil. Because, you see, in interpreting things, people reveal themselves. They project their own secret evils and sins onto other situations. And, of course, this kind of approach to Hawthorne reveals his profound interest in the psychology of Puritanism. With the clergy constantly pounding on their congregations, describing sin in the most salacious terms, people were obsessed with it. At the same time, they tried to repress it all the time. And urges that were physical or emotional or connected with the affections. It was a constant state of, of anxiety about these and an attempt to repress. And of course, the result of repression, as we all know, is that it creates obsessions and it creates different outlets. It creates suspicion. It creates other psychological behavior. And I suspect that this is the kind of thing that. Uh, that uh, Hawthorne is exploring in this story, the, um, the way in which the, uh, the Puritan character tends to project evil everywhere and see evil where it may not be. And the, uh, the minister's black veil is a way of allowing Hawthorne to explore the psychology of a, an, an obsessed population in this village. It has a profound effect, but the effect is not particularly because of what Hooper says. He's not really a very enlightening minister. He's, he's, he's not charismatic. He's certainly not a Jonathan Edwards or anyone like that. His effect is simply because he wears this veil, which is kind of symbol, which is interpreted in many different ways by the people in the town. Well, young Goodman Brown is an equally interesting story. The story of a naive young man, newly married, just three months to his wife, Faith. He is a, a, a third generation Puritan. He has a, a Puritan family of renowned people, his father and his grandfather, and in the story, he makes a journey one night into the forest uh, around Salem, where he lives. And this challenges his assumptions about his community, about his family, and about his wife. And the result, to put it very simply, is that he is changed forever. Now, he leaves his wife behind, his wife of three months against her pleas, 
promising that he will thereafter stay by her side forever. In the woods, he keeps an appointment with an older man who, who has a kind of double function. On the one hand, he looks, that becomes apparent soon, he looks very much like an older Goodman Brown, let's say an, an old Goodman Brown. But he also has a serpent-like staff, which I think clearly suggests that, that he is a kind of devil figure. And that conjunction of an old Goodman Brown and a devil figure in itself is a very interesting one. It, it may be suggesting that Goodman Brown is seeing evil in himself and its end result. It's rather demonic. He soon learns that his father, his, his uh, renowned Puritan father and grandfather, made this same journey into the forest. He soon learns unpleasant truths about them, about how they beat Quaker women, for instance, which of course is historically something that did happen. The Puritans even hanged a few Quakers uh, simply because of their beliefs. And how uh, they beat Indians and burned their villages during King Philip's War, which, which we referred to in, in connection with uh, the captivity narrative by Rowlandson, you'll recall. One by one, young Goodman Brown meets uh, people he's looked up to and respected, and um, all, of course, are on the same road into the forest that Goodman Brown is on. And he learns sort of secondhand that a young man is going to be inducted into a group and senses that they were talking about him, or if he doesn't sense it immediately, certainly the reader senses it. He tries to resist by remembering his wife, whose name Faith clearly puts her into the realm of the symbolic. Remembering her, of course, is, is um, allows him also to, to use the strength of his faith, his religion. And um, then he learns that a young woman is going to be inducted. And that's when, of course, the alarms go up and we realize that even faith may be out here in the forest. And it turns out um, she is. The revelation that he receives is that the people of his community, including past members that, uh, of the community, like his father and grandfather, are wicked sinners, disciples of evil, worshipers of witchcraft. At the last moment, uh, as he and Faith are standing there and, and about to be inducted into this mysterious group of devil worshippers, I suppose, in the forest, Goodman Brown tells his wife to look up to heaven. And, of course, whether she did or did not is not made entirely clear in the story, but almost every, immediately everything just disappears, and <coughs> Goodman Brown is left alone in the forest. And, uh, <coughs> and then, of course, he returns to Salem, the last couple of pages are about his return to Salem and uh, the, the shock of then looking anew at all of the people that he's seen out in the forest on this journey into evil. And he goes through the rest of his life with faith but disillusioned. Everyone around him is, is seen differently. He has many children and many grandchildren, a huge clan, and, and he lives to a ripe old age, but he dies, it's very clear at the end, a grim, gloomy old man with, with no hope. Now, I've said that young Goodman Brown is a naive young man. Uh, he's supposedly a good man, as his name would suggest, but his fateful journey into the forest is naively stupid. Here, for instance, um, he says, My love and my faith, of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey must needs be done, 
twixt now and sunrise. Um, it's been suggested that this, of all nights in the year, uh, one critic, I think, I guess it's Harry Levin, uh, suggested that this is probably October 31st, uh, which is what, All Hallows' Eve? Halloween comes from it. Interesting because that, um, that particular evil night goes back uh, finally into, um, into Catholicism, but this is something that has survived into Protestantism. Um, but certainly he's, he's um, naive. He's taking chances in being tempting, tempted. Um, you know, he's turning over his fate into the powers of evil. And, um, and then he seems, what's odd about it is, having done this himself, he seems so naive that he doesn't expect that other people will do the same. He's quite surprised to see all these good citizens out there. I mean, he's a good citizen. I suppose he thinks of himself as a good citizen, yet he's kind of surprised to see all the other good citizens of Salem out there in the forest doing what he's doing. And, and these words, of course, uh, quoted here um, to his wife are naive and condescending. Say thy prayers, dear faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. Uh, and his subsequent subsequently expressed belief that after this one night he can cling to faith, faith's skirts and follow her to heaven also seems uh, foolhardy and, and naive. He's tampering in, within a Puritan system, and I realize this, this may not make a whole uh, a huge mark upon a 20th century reader, but within the Puritan system he is tampering with his eternal salvation here. That's clear if you get within the context of the story, which we need to do when we read Hawthorne. And uh, this is indeed a naive and fatefully dangerous thing to do. And how can he plan to be clean, so to speak, in the future? How can he plan to cling to faith's skirts and follow her to heaven when in fact he's already shown that his planning is corrupt. I mean, he's making plans this very night to go out and meet somebody. There's a prearranged meeting. This, this circles around to one of those central uh, problems in Puritanism, one of the reasons why a man can't save himself in Puritanism. This is a central doc doctrine, you'll recall it that Protestantism reacted against the Catholic idea that you could save yourself through penance and certain kinds of, of good behavior. Puritanism adopted the other point of view and, and Protestantism that you couldn't save yourself. That because man was totally depraved, all efforts to work one's own salvation would necessarily be depraved efforts. It so could not be successful. And you have a little bit of that doctrine creeping in here uh, and it's clear that he's also guilty. Uh, faith has perfect faith in him, but he asks her, Dost thou doubt me already, and we but three months married? And I think from any psychological point of view, we'd say, well, he's projecting his own guilty conscience onto her. He's jumping to conclusions. She gives no sign that she is she is suspicious in any way. His error, I think, is clearly that he's exposing himself to evil and temptation on the theory that he can resist. And within a Puritan framework, what kind of sin is that? It is the sin of presumption within the, the definition of Puritanism, one can never presume that one can resist evil and temptation on one's own. It always requires the help of God. And so he is, is guilty of the sin of presumption that he can by himself resist, and even more, that God will forgive him. 
that going on a journey like this into evil is something that he can take lightheartedly because, after all, God will come round and forgive him. Anyway, that within a Puritan system is an absolute heresy. Now, there are other things to say here if we try to interpret this, uh, this allegory, I suppose. It seems to be an allegory in that faith is, you know, stands not only for his wife but for his religion. If he is just three months married to faith, following that through allegorically, he appears to be a recent convert to the Puritan religion. Three months ago he's converted to the Puritan religion. Now this presents a puzzle because the story suggests that his father and his grandfather were good Puritans. So how could he be in a line of good Puritans, grandfather and father, and yet be a recent convert to the Puritan religion? Well, here we need to, to remember a little bit of Puritan history. The, to become, to be recognized as a Puritan, one was supposed to show signs of having God's grace. This was a problem in the early Puritan years in New England because it meant that children couldn't be, couldn't be part of the religion until they were old enough to manifest God's grace. And uh, the early Puritans recognized that their numbers were going to greatly dwindle in this situation. And this is why the halfway covenant was invented in 1662, which allowed a baby to be baptized and to be in a halfway situation. Their full entry into the church would then be held off until their adult years when some kind of grace situation was apparent and then they could be admitted to full membership. The Halfway Covenant um, was, was 1662 and as I say it allowed children and grandchildren to, to grow up within the church without being fully admitted, pending a kind of full conversion at, in their adult years. And this would explain how Goodman Brown is both a descendant of Puritans in his grandfather and his father and also a recent convert. He is an example of someone, he's a third generation Puritan who grew up in this halfway situation and now he's converted into it. Uh, presumably then he's waited for God's grace for years and now just recently he's evidenced signs of God's grace and allowed him a, f a full marriage to the faith. Now, doctrinally, I think it, it's clear that this story comments on the halfway covenant, which allowed hundreds of Puritan youth to attend church on the presumption that grace would come. And notice the way I've phrased that, on the presumption that grace would come. This essentially, within the Puritan context, actually tended to weaken the Puritan religion. When grace finally came to the adult, the, the person was in a position where they could say, well, that was easy. And of course you see that presumption is occurring here, that the Puritans in introducing the halfway covenant were actually introducing the sin of, of a possible sin of presumption into the system. And um, this of course then laid the groundwork for the possible falling out of grace and the attitude that one could fall out of grace and easily get back into grace. And you see how the the, the youth of, of waiting for grace and then the easy entrance into the religion uh, could set up the, f the framework for an attitude that one could fall in and out very easily. One could indulge momentarily and still be saved. In other words, young Goodman's Brown's moral laxity has been prepared for by the structure of the religion of which he is a part. Arguably, he never really did receive full grace. Uh, 
no one who had, we could argue, would ever expose themselves to temptation in this way. But, of course, you may say, well, this all seems overly uh, theological, a throwback to the 17th century. Uh, didn't we leave all this behind a dozen classes ago? Well, not with Hawthorne. He was immersed in it totally. He studied it. But, as I've already pointed out, he was most interested in the psychology of sin. So, if we maybe feel a little impatient with this Puritanism and the technicalities of Puritan theology, we need to, to understand that this is just a backdrop for Hawthorne. What he's interested in the, is in the psychology that operated in Puritanism in the situation of sin and guilt, of secret sin, of grace, of doubt, and temptation. He's interested in that whole complex of things, not as theological ideas, but as psychological experiences. The time of, of, of the story is clearly sometime after the halfway covenant of 1662. The witchcraft scene at the end and the hints of witchcraft would, would move it more towards 1692 when the Salem witchcraft trials uh, occurred. So Hawthorne is exploiting uh, a complicated psychology of the converted Puritan uh, during this very dramatic period in uh, Puritan history. Gooden Brown is, is really just one example of the kind of breakdown that was occurring in Puritanism at this time. Um, well, we could, we could uh, I suppose, uh, conclude that Goodman Brown was a, uh, had already dabbled in the world of sin before he had been married. The sin, of course, would probably mean sins of, of self-indulgence, perhaps even sexual activity. Uh, and Puritan youth was not exempt from sexual activity, despite their, uh, their high moral tone. We know from comparing uh, birth records and marriage records that a substantial percentage of young Puritan maids came to the altar already well impregnated. So, um, young Goodman Brown has had a normal adolescence. Now he's married, he's found his faith, and he's slipping back into the old ways. Does this mean that neither his marriage nor his faith is, is completely satisfactory? Perhaps. Perhaps. In any case, Brown journeys into the forest, caught in the presumption that he can return to the bosom of faith very easily, his sweet pink ribboned wife. She will always be there. His religion will always be there. Meanwhile, he can explore evil and indulge himself with impunity, maybe enjoying a little titillating dose of witchcraft out in the dark satanic forest. Uh, well, the experiences he has are unnerving. He meets Goody Cloys, for instance, his moral and spiritual advisor. She's on the road into the woods. And then um, he sees the minister uh, and Deacon Gookin. Um, they're talking about the meeting that is to come. And then, of course, he finds that faith is out there too, and he takes this to mean that his faith is gone. And uh, then at the forest meeting, he meets all kinds of members of the council of the, of the colony, church members from the Salem village, criminals and wretches, and they're all mixing together. The, the sinners and the saints are all mixing together. His own dead father, his mother. Martha Carrier is there. Remember Martha Carrier, who was the witch who was um, allegedly uh, made a pact with the devil to become the queen of heaven? Well, she's out there. So, and, and this, is what, uh, this is what he's told at that, at that meeting. He and his faith are told there are all whom ye have reverence from youth. Ye deemed them holier than yourselves and shrank from your own sin, contrasting it with their lives of righteousness and prayerful aspirations heavenward. Yet here are they all in my worshiping assembly. This night it shall be granted you to know their secret sins. 
how hoary bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households. How many a woman eager for widow's weeds has given her husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom. How beardless youths have made haste to inherit their father's wealth. And how fair damsels blush not, sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden with me, the sole guest. Well, the final revelation put simply in a quotation from the story itself, evil is the nature of mankind. And that revelation, of course, is a central doctrine of Calvinist theology. Man is totally depraved. But what Hawthorne has done is turn it into a kind of parable, parody of revelation. And that often happens in the presentation of evil in religious works. They become a kind of parody of the religion. One, one thinks, for instance, of, of Dante and the bottom of the inferno where, where uh, Satan is a parody of the Trinity and, and so on, blowing out his, his great wind with his wings as a kind of parody of the mighty wind of Pentecost from God. Um, one interesting question comes up in the text. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch meeting? Be it so, if you will. But alas, it was a dream of evil omen for young Goodman Brown. Is the whole story a dream? Well, that question opens up the possibility and, and Hawthorne doesn't take a position and so we can interpret it that way. And uh, certainly, if you look at the way characters appear in the story, they don't appear as solid beings that are actually met. They all always appear as specters or figures, kind of apparitions, as, almost as if they could be specters in a dream. Sometimes they simply vanish. And at the end, when young Goodman Brown cries out to heaven, the whole scene vanishes. So perhaps this is all, is all a, a dream. And and now we see, you could see if that's the case, the whole thing is a kind of interior psychological drama with the major figures being the participants in the Puritan community of, of sin and guilt and total depravity. Well, here are Hawthorne's uh, principal novels, though novel is not quite the correct word to apply. The term novel tends to uh, refer more to a realistic portrayal of the world, something uh, more akin to the kinds of things that appeared after the Civil War. Uh, the term that is used most often for these is romance. The House of the Seven Gables uh, begins in Puritan times, struggle between two families, witchcraft uh, trial, the declining fortunes of the Pynchon family, an ancient curse upon that family by the rival family called the Malls. It's a novel which could, contains history, legend, superstition, and a good load of Gothic detail. And all of those, uh, many of those elements, as, as you can see just from that kind of brief summary, fit this into the whole uh, framework of Romanticism. The Blythedale Romance is set at a fictional place called Blythedale, um, which of course is modeled on Brook Farm. The the utopian community where Hawthorne stayed. Remember, the Transcendentalist Club was closely connected with this. George Ripley had founded Brook Farm. Hawthorne stayed there for six or seven months. This is a novel of romance, of frustrated desire, of, of death. And, uh, and again, you have got sort of the dark lady and the fair woman. Uh, which lines up with previous polarized characters that we've seen in Edgar Allan Poe and, and Cooper. 
Hawthorne spent some time in England. He had a, a, a political appointment in England, and after that he went to Italy. And The Marble Fawn, his last work, came out of his time in Italy. It's a strangely mythic sort of book. Uh, and um, not read too often. It is so mythic and legendary and, and almost supernatural in its, in its plot and, and so on that, that it veers even further from reality compared with these other books. Of these, of course, The Scarlet Letter uh, stands as the masterwork, one of the great works of literature, American literature, and indeed of world literature. The Scarlet Letter is clearly based on a firm Puritan background. There is, for instance, in the, in the chapter 1 mentioned, this is on page 2202, that the burial ground was laid out on Isaac Johnson's lot. And in fact, Isaac Johnson is a real character. He came out in 1630 to Massachusetts Bay. He died the year he came out. That left his lot of land available. And um, this land was used to construct the prison, the graveyard, and the church at the center of Boston. In the first paragraph of chapter 2, there is mention, this is on page 2203, there's mention of, of Mistress Hibbins, a witch. Factually, Anne Hibbins, a widow in Boston, was condemned as a witch and hanged in Boston in 1656. We need to remind ourselves that there were, that the, there were witches occasionally condemned and hanged before the Salem trials of 1692. On page 2211, this is in chapter 3, Governor Bellingham is mentioned. And again, this is fact. Richard Bellingham was truly the governor of Massachusetts in 1641, again in 1654, and again for seven years, from 1665 to 72. These background characters and, and references in themselves are not important to the plot of the story. I want to emphasize that. But they do establish that the Scarlet Letter is, among other things, an historical novel or an historical romance. Historical means, of course, that actual events of fact have been used as a background for the story uh, to give it authenticity in terms of detail and, and what actually went on. The romance part of it, of course, uh, refers to what the author has um, added. Hawthorne uh, read a great deal about the Puritans. In fact, he had almost an obsession about Puritan history. During the 12-year period after graduation from 1825 until 1837, he borrowed nearly every book in the Salem Athenaeum, which was the public library. His sister-in-law, Elizabeth Peabody, wrote that he was exceptionally knowledge about Salem history, especially the witchcraft era. His reading included Cotton Mather's Wonders of the Invisible World and the Magnalia and many other books besides. And uh, Hawthorne pored over old records. He got into the Salem Annals, which was like bound copies of the old newspapers and records and read them. He got ideas from, for his tales from these. The, the, the Hooper story, for instance, the minister's, black, minister's uh, black veil is something that he probably found in those records. Um, now, we can actually date events here. Um, in chapter 12 of the Scarlet Letter, there is a chapter called The Minister's Vigil, and it, it Governor Winthrop has died, and you'll recall Governor Winthrop from earlier in the course. He preached the sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, and, and so on. We know the precise date of that, March 26, 1649. For artistic reasons, Hawthorne has altered the date by a few weeks uh, and made this night an obscure night early in May. The reason appears to be that he wants to compress the events of the last half of the novel into two weeks. 
Uh, but from this, we are then able to pr produce a kind of chronology for the, uh, the Scarlet Letter. Chapters 1 to 4 take place seven years earlier than that in the Boston market. This is when Hester is put out with her Scarlet A on her, uh, on her bodice, June 1642. Uh, chapters 7 and 8 uh, take place at Bellingham's home late summer of 1645, and we know it would be that year because on page 2236 we learn that Pearl is three years old. And then chapter 12 takes place in the market on a Saturday at midnight, early May 1649. And those are the, the fairly firm dates. They, they, of course, all work from that chapter 12 date uh, where Winthrop dies. They work backwards by subtraction and so on. The rest of the book, chapters 13 to 23, uh, take place over a period of two to three weeks. Let's review where these things are. Here's again the map of, of New England. You might be able to tell from this that Boston here is on a peninsula. Here's, here's a close-up of that peninsula, surrounded by water. This is the Atlantic out here. Here's the center of the city. We get a little closer on that. This has been reconstructed from historical uh, records, and if we uh, get even uh, even closer, we can get right into the center of town. Here is that that piece of property um, that was given over for. There's the prison. Um, the jailkeeper, uh, Brackett, who's mentioned in the text, lived uh, next door. Here's the burial ground down here on the corner. Here's the school. This is the meeting house, which doubled as the church. So you see you have the church, the meeting house, the prison, the burial ground, and the school all on this central little plot of land. Uh, this was uh, over, over here is the marketplace where the scaffold is and where uh, where Scarlet is displayed. Over here is Governor Bellingham's mansion. So you can see that we can, uh, we can actually get a picture from the old maps of where things were, of just how close and compact all of this, this whole area here is a very small area. Of course, it's all built over. None of this survives now. It's all high rise and so on. So, all right, let us turn the last few minutes of the class, let us look at American Romanticism. We have another author here to add. Uh, you'll recall that we've been working on features of Romanticism and examples under these three headings, the subject matter of Romanticism, techniques of Romanticism, philosophy of Romanticism, and we have worked with Irving and Cooper and Edgar Allan Poe and, um, of course, Emerson too. Let's, for a moment, look at the first of these, the subject matter of Romanticism, because we have more examples now. And we've got um, three screens here on, on point one, the subject matter of Romanticism. Uh, we have, first of all, an emphasis on the past. And uh, you've seen this before in, in earlier classes, but what I want to point out here is now that we can add in here uh, the European past is, is certainly something that we do find in Romanticism, and in this case we have Italy used in Hawthorne's Rappuccini's Daughter and in the Marble Faun, that last romance which is dated to uh, 1860. And uh, romance uh, generally was interested in the past and the distant, and Europe certainly functioned as, as a way of achieving distance, the long ago and the far away sort of idea. is very common in Romanticism. Now that's the one addition to, to that part of this topic uh, from Hawthorne. But now, if we continue down here with the American past and look at some of the examples, of course, we had the Dutch period in Irving's History of New York. Continuing on to that with more examples, Again, much of this is familiar. 
Um, but we can certainly come down here through examples in Irving and Cooper, and again Cooper, to the Puritan era, and here is where Hawthorne fits. His works uh, are in a kind of extended uh, usage of the Puritan era, and we find that in the works we've looked at so far in, in young Goodman Brown, which seems clearly to be placed after the halfway covenant and during the witchcraft trials in the late 16th century. Certainly the minister's uh, black veil, and we, could, we, we can kind of reconstruct back to somewhere in the 1680s with that, based on the real life incident that was based on. The Maypole of Marymount, we commented on briefly, is not in our text. This ties very closely to Thomas Morton and the work we read earlier in the course. Uh, in uh, New English Canaan. And of course, both the Scarlet Letter and the House of the Seven Gables, which are probably his two most important uh, romances, draw extensively on the Puritan past in New England. Now, continuing on to other aspects uh, here of, of uh, the content of American Romanticism, we, we move on. We've talked about idealized heroes and heroines, and the, the examples that we so far had are Leather Stocking and Cooper and, and Poe's women, uh, Annabelle Lee, Eleanor, and Ligeia. But now we can add other idealized characters, and particularly women, uh, Georgiana and Beatrice and Hester. All are portrayed in highly idealistic terms. And when we come down to the, the whole business of madness and obsession, uh, we can certainly point to Rappaccini in that story and Aylmer, both of these being, of course, mad scientists and in, with a kind of Faustian obsession, which we talked about briefly. But uh, Father Hooper is obsessed, too, in a strange way, wearing this veil. I mean, you, you have to be obsessed to wear a veil for a whole lifetime, never take it off. Now, there, of course, could be many more examples added. If you dug into the 50 or 60 tales of Hawthorne, you would find example after example that would, could be fitted into this. What we're, we're trying to do here is just use the examples that are in the course. But you can see that, that this literature, once you begin to look at it, really is of a kind of package. Let's move on to the second feature of Romanticism. We're looking at the techniques of American Romanticism, and here we have again three panels. Um, the, um, the addition here is certainly in the symbolize, symbolism of characterization. Uh, we've seen these polar characters in, in uh, Cooper and in Poe, but what we find in Hawthorne is characters being developed almost as pure symbols, and certainly Hawthorne's Faith, Father Hooper, and Pearl would be the most pronounced examples of, of pure symbols, characters who are pure symbols. If we then move on, still in the techniques of American Romanticism, to a third point, point C, um, we could talk about imaginative or fantastic settings, and of course our early examples are all from Poe and, and so on, uh, but here the addition would certainly be uh, Rappuccini's Garden and the forest in Young Goodman Brown. These are all uh, imaginative or fantastic settings, and maybe with the Young Goodman Brown setting it may even be a dream setting. And finally, um, we can move to our final point under technique, point D, and that is the use of Gothic details. And most of these examples uh, earlier came from Poe, but now we have a use of the grotesque and horrible. And in addition to things like Usher and Lige and the black cat and Poe, I think we can add Rappuccini's daughter and the birthmark, 
because the poisoning of the daughter and so on and the removal of the birthmark certainly is of that kind. And then we've got an old decaying mansion in the House of the Seven Gables. Well, we'll go on with the Scarlet Letter next day and fit this into the scheme. Have a good day.